Chris Cameron, and you'll see his book in the back, he earned his PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2010. He's an associate professor of history at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. His research interests are African American religious and intellectual history, slavery and abolition, religious liberalism and American secularism. He's the founding president of the African American Intellectual History Society and its group blog called Black Perspectives. And he's the author of To Plead Our Own Cause, African Americans in Massachusetts and the Making of the Anti-Slavery Movement and co-editor of New Perspectives on the Black Intellectual Position. He's author of a fascinating book, which we have in our library and we've talked about on our radio show, Black Freethinkers, A History of African American Secularism, published by Northwestern University Press. He's going to talk about black freethinkers, and he will sign copies of his book, Black Freethinkers, at the close of this morning's session. So please welcome Professor Chris Cameron. Good morning, everyone. Um, so today I'll give sort of a broad overview of the research I did and some of my main findings from my book, Black Free Thinkers, A History of African American Secularism. From March 21st to 26th, 1953, Langston Hughes, poet, author, and playwright of Harlem Renaissance fame, testified before Joseph McCarthy's Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations regarding the atheist and communist themes in his 1932 poem, Goodbye Christ. At one point during the testimony, Senator Everett Dirksen of Illinois wanted to know whether Hughes thought the book is dead, referring to the Bible, and whether or not Goodbye Christ could be considered an accurate reflection of African American religious values. Dirksen noted that he was very familiar with African Americans, he wasn't, and knew them to be innately a very devout and religious people, in his words. Dirksen's statement regarding the supposed innate religiosity of African Americans has become a widespread belief among scholars and in American popular culture. It is an idea that stretches back at least to the 1830s when Unitarian minister William Ellery Channing noted in his 1835 book, Slavery, that, quote, the colored race are said to be peculiarly susceptible of the religious sentiment, something that he argued led to an overly affectionate nature. Freethinkers later in the 19th century gave credence to this idea with William MacDonald, editor of The Truth Seeker, proclaiming in an 1883 article that there's no class of people in the world more religious than the Negroes. Their fervent African temperament makes them peculiarly susceptible to religious sentiment. These notions are themselves rooted in the idea that African Americans are barbarous, uncivilized, controlled by their emotions rather than logic and reason, and thus incapable of grasping the subtleties of secular thought. As the Presbyterian minister Charles Colcock Jones noted in surprise among encountering deism and skepticism uh, in the antebellum slave community, these ideas were usually only found in the cultivated minds, the ripe scholarship and profound intelligence of critics and philosophers. My book, Black Freethinkers, builds off the pioneering work of contemporary scholars and black atheists, such as Sakivu Hutchinson and Anthony Penn, to show that despite the ubiquity of notions of blacks as naturally religious, there's a long and storied tradition of secularism within African American culture. African American freethought first arose in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, and it was a homegrown domestic movement. Unlike the European Enlightenment origins of free thought among uh, intellectuals such as Thomas Jefferson or Thomas Paine, black free thought grew out of the lived realities of uh, enslaved people, grew out of, out of the institution of slavery and the conditions that blacks endured within it. The increased evangelism to slaves that characterized the second great awakening of the 19th century also brought to the fore what many saw to be the hypocritical nature of their Christian masters, including the very practice of holding slaves itself, but also the way that their masters treated them. 
So one of the key reasons that African Americans in the 19th century embraced free thought was an inability to resolve the problem of evil, this question of how to reconcile the existence of evil in the world with the presence of a benevolent and omnipotent deity. For many, if not all slaves, the problem of evil was intimately related to their daily lives, when they experienced brutal punishments, when they experienced sexual assault or families uh, being sold away. While uh, many enslaved people did find meaning in religion, whether monotheistic ones such as Christianity or African-derived traditions such as conjure, others rejected religion altogether. And I found quite a lot of evidence for this in some of the same sources that scholars use to explore the black religious experience, namely slave narratives. When I went to these sources sort of asking different questions uh, than most other scholars, I found that these narratives also speak to the presence of atheism within 19th century slave communities. One enslaved man named Austin Stewart, for example, from Prince William County, Virginia, immediately after he discusses a brutal whipping that his sister endured on a Sabbath, a point he's, uh, he, he makes uh, quite a few times, he asks in his narrative, can anyone wonder that I and other slaves often doubted the sincerity of every white man's religion. Can it be a matter of astonishment that slaves often feel there is no just God for the poor African? Another enslaved man named Charles Ball likewise reflects on the irreligiosity present within slave communities in his autobiography. He writes, there is in general very little sense of religious obligation or duty amongst the slaves on the cotton plantations and Christianity cannot be with propriety called the religion of these people. They have not the slightest religious regard for the Sabbath day, and their masters make no efforts to impress them with the least respect for the sacred institution. He goes on to say many slaves just prefer to rest on uh, their one day off, right? Um, have a few drinks, spend time with their family. Some even cultivated a garden plot. Um, but he also speaks to another key factor, um, sort of pushing slaves away from religion, namely the opposition of their masters. And there were different schools of thought on this, right? A lot of masters believe that uh, inculcating a particular type of Christianity would make their slaves more docile uh, and compliant. But then there were events like Nat Turner's Rebellion in 1831, whereby 69 whites uh, were killed by um, a rebellion led by a slave preacher that led a lot of other masters to think that, you know, there are some really dangerous elements in Christianity and we want to keep those away from uh, enslaved people. Another key development that fostered the growth of African-American atheism during the 19th century was the rise and increasing prevalence of pro-slavery religion. Uh, this became much more prominent after 1830 when the abolitionist movement sort of ramped up with the creation of groups like the American Anti-Slavery Society and the start uh, of publications like uh, William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator magazine. Prior to that, there were certainly individuals who uh, argued and, and took action against slavery, but the movement became much more widespread and much more organized after the 1830s, so defenders of slavery felt that they sort of needed to do the same, uh, and they kind of ramped up their efforts and you know, came up with a lot of uh, religious defenses of slavery, right? The curse of Ham, uh, the fact that Jesus never preached against it, um, but probably the main one was that uh, slavery was a tool to Christianize uh, uncivilized and savage Africans, right? While their bodies might be uh, enslaved here on earth, their souls will be free uh, in heaven. One enslaved man named Henry Bibb notes of white preachers in his autobiography that the slaves, with but few exceptions, have no confidence at all in their preaching because they preach a pro-slavery doctrine, something that says, servants, be obedient to your masters, and he that knoweth his master's will and doeth it not shall be beaten with many stripes. Most enslaved people felt they were destined to die in bondage unless they were delivered by some be uh, deity. And Bibb notes that when that doesn't happen, they cannot believe or trust in such a religion as above named. 
So most of the evidence that we have for uh, free thought comes from uh, these slave narratives. Uh, a lot of the people are sort of anonymous, right? You get um, writers like Bibb or Charles Ball reflecting on atheism within their communities, but we don't necessarily know who these people are. There are some exceptions, right? Frederick Douglass uh, and William Wells Brown are probably the two main ones um, that we know of, but uh, free thought in the 19th century uh, among African Americans wouldn't necessarily be um, an organized movement, right? You have bits and pieces and, and pockets of atheism uh, here and there. That would start to change during the 20th century, uh, especially with the rise of the Harlem Renaissance or the New Negro Renaissance, a literary, um, artistic, and cultural movement that spanned the years from roughly 1919 to about 1935, uh, some scholars argue 1940. The Harlem Renaissance itself uh, was a product of the Great Migration to the North, which saw approximately one and a half million black Southerners migrating to northern cities like Chicago, uh, Detroit, New York, and Philadelphia. They're being pushed out by uh, sort of a revived Ku Klux Klan uh, and increasing racism in the South, but also being pulled to the North uh, by the prevalence of manufacturing jobs with a lot of uh, whites off uh, fighting in World War I. So um, after World War I, one development that we saw was sort of anti-communist hysteria rampant throughout the country. Um, and any association of sort of anti-racist efforts and activism, uh, that was quickly associated with communism, right? So there's an increasing prevalence of race riots in 1919 and 1920. And it, it led a lot of black leaders to try to take different or creative approaches, uh, approaches to solving the problem of racism. And one was the rise of cultural politics, right? Uh, if we're gonna be the victims of race riots by openly protesting uh, against racism, maybe another tack to take, black leaders said, is to uh, show our equality, to show our uh, fitness for citizenship through our artistic and literary uh, productions, right? So this was one sort of impetus behind the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and it became such an important moment because it, it had the effect of bringing together uh, a lot of religious skeptics and, and free thinkers who uh, might have been isolated in their small uh, Midwestern or Southern communities, but now all of a sudden they're in a place like Harlem or they're in a place like Chicago with like-minded, educated, cosmopolitan people, right? Uh, some you know, examples of this are Zora Neale Hurston, who grew up the preacher's daughter uh, in Eatonville, Florida, and writes in her autobiography that she started um, questioning religion at a very young age, but nobody around her was doing that as well, and she felt that she would be ostracized in her small uh, southern community for making her thoughts uh, known to her friends, right? So she kept these ideas uh, to herself, and she pushed them down. Same was true uh, with Langston Hughes growing up in Joplin, Missouri, right? And he uh, came to the realization that he didn't believe in God um, around 13, 14 years old, um, but would never really feel free to express that until he had moved to Harlem uh, and started to build community uh, with these other free thinkers. Uh, so the Harlem Renaissance is uh, rife with writings by uh, atheists, right? Um, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, Elaine Locke, uh, the man widely uh, heralded as the father of the Harlem Renaissance, and James Weldon Johnson. Novels, plays, um, poems allowed free thinkers to express their critiques of religion in um, kind of creative ways where they could almost sort of disassociate themselves from it, right? They could say, oh, that, that's just a poem, right? I'm just being creative, or that's just a novel. It isn't necessarily uh, my ideas. Uh, one of the most important sources to explore um, free thought during this Renaissance period was Nella Larson's 1928 novel, Quicksand. Um, the central character in this novel is a woman named Helga Crane. It begins with her sort of stating her dissatisfaction uh, with the school Naxos, an anagram of Saxon, uh, 
Um, and the, the main thing that uh, causes her discomfort with this school is religion and the sort of respectability of the middle class uh, African Americans around her. She doesn't like that she's forced to go to church, to wear certain types of clothes, to act a certain way. She quickly leaves there, she goes to Chicago, she thinks she might be able to build community there with other African Americans and goes to a large black church. She's pretty much spurned and ignored by everybody there, right? Um, so throughout the novel, every time she's sort of encountering uh, religious people, they're always pretty negative. Um, and even at the very end, the same is true, right? She makes a very rash decision uh, towards the end of the novel to marry a revival preacher from Alabama named Reverend Mr. Pleasant Green. Uh, so she, she moves from Harlem down to this rural community in Alabama. She's the preacher's wife. In three years, she has four children, including a set of twins. Um, and after the fourth, she's pretty much laid up on her deathbed, realizing how her life is just absolutely terrible. It's not what she wanted for herself. And it's, it all boils down to her decision to sort of accept this heteronormative patriarchal life, uh, which itself was based on Christianity. At the very end, she writes, with the obscuring curtain of religion rent, she was able to look about her and see with shocked eyes this thing she had done to herself. She couldn't, she thought ironically, even blame God for it. Now that she knew he didn't exist. Um, so th this is one example of how uh, literature becomes a really important source for, free think for black free thinkers especially to be able to express their ideas uh, without it necessarily being associated with them uh, personally, right? That starts to change in the 1940s. So folks like Langston Hughes uh, publishes his autobiography, The Big C, where he sort of is a little more open um, about his religious skepticism. Same is true with uh, Zora Neale Hurston's autobiography, Dust Tracks on a Road, um, also published in the 1940s. Now, during the same era as the Harlem Renaissance, I noted that many African Americans were sort of loath to embrace uh, open political radicalism. Well, others uh, had absolutely no problem with that. So during the 19-teens and the 1920s, we see an increasing number of African Americans embracing socialism uh, and communism. Um, and this sort of worked hand in hand with the rise of African American secularism uh, during this period, right? Because socialists and communists uh, were very uh, antithetical to religion, right? The Comintern, the Communist International in 1926 put out a very explicit directive that we expect communists to be atheists, right? If you went to a communist meeting anywhere in the United States or probably most places in the world and they, they knew you went to to church or they knew you were religious or something, you would be ostracized and shunned. You'd be expected uh, to put your religion away, right? Um, and socialists and communism, uh, communism became increasingly appealing to African Americans because at least uh, theoretically they subsumed issues of race under issues of class, right? Um, and this became especially more appealing during the early 1930s when the Communist Party came out in strong support uh, for the Scottsboro Boys who were wrong, falsely accused of sexual assaults in Alabama, right? Um, so many uh, African-American intellectuals and black secularists also embraced communism, including Claude McKay, uh, Louise Thompson Patterson, A. Philip Randolph, and Chandler Owen, publishers of the Messenger magazine, uh, and Hubert Harrison, who's widely hailed uh, during his time as one of the most towering uh, black intellectuals um, of the day. Harrison played an important role uh, in Harlem politics and saw himself as sort of an apostle of free thought to African American communities, right? And uh, with Hubert Harrison and with early 20th century black free thought, this is where you start to see the traditions of black and white free thought beginning to converge a little bit. This is where you see uh, African Americans starting to um, come to their religious skepticism through an engagement uh, with, you know, readings by uh, Thomas Paine or Robert Ingersoll, right? Um, indeed, Hubert Harrison saw himself as a figure very much akin to Paine, right? Somebody who could take really kind of complicated ideas, boil them down for his broad audience uh, in New York City, and try to convert African Americans to secularism. He thought that um, black people had suffered more than any other group in this country uh, under Christianity, and that they should be the very first ones uh, to embrace free thought.
So from, uh, from there, my book turns to a discussion of secularism and uh, the black power movement uh, during the 1960s and 1970s. And just as in earlier periods, black free thinkers are central players uh, in civil rights. And we can see this especially with the black power movement. Black power emerged out of the civil rights activity of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in 1966. Um, so SNCC had, uh, had been created in 1960 and was initially led by Christian activists such as James Lawson and John Lewis who were committed to the philosophy of nonviolence. Uh, this philosophy and approach soon began to change, however, especially after uh, James Foreman took over the group. Uh, so Foreman grew up in rural Mississippi um, and he started moving away from religion as a pretty young man. In a scene repeated in many autobiographies and memoirs of black freethinkers, Foreman writes in his book, The Making of Black Revolutionaries, that um, at the age of 12, he was attending a revival service. Uh, some of his friends shouted out that they had gotten religion, and the older people shouted this too. He says, at the age of 12 in a Baptist tradition and setting, I did not have the courage to tell my grandmother that I thought this was all nonsense. I simply observed what had been happening around me and knew that I too could fabricate some tears in this emotionally charged atmosphere. So I covered my face with my handkerchief and cried, Lord, have mercy. It worked. I was taken off the mourner's bench and the people talked of how many children got saved that day by the grace of the Lord. In my research, I found very similar stories in a number of uh, African-American freethinkers' autobiographies, right? Langston Hughes has a very similar story um, about growing up in Joplin, Missouri and attending a revival service there. Richard Wright has one, uh, James Baldwin. Um, this is sort of a recurring theme among black freethinkers, one, the pressure that they experience from their community uh, to convert to Christianity, but also the moment where they sort of fake this conversion actually becomes the moment where they become atheists or they become agnostics, right? Now, Foreman would formally embrace atheism after studying philosophy at Wilson Junior College in Chicago, and he would bring his secular perspective to his civil rights activity. He became the executive secretary of SNCC in 1963 and grounded his activism in secular humanism as he believed that Christianity was a prime reason that blacks were in a subordinate position in the United States. In 1966, Foreman, along with Stokely Carmichael, led the transition of SNCC from a religious to a secular organization and inaugurated the Black Power Movement, the major goals of which were promoting black economic advancement, a pride in black culture, independent black political action, and armed self-reliance, or a rejection of uh, nonviolence, the sort of major tactic um, of the more traditional wing of the civil rights movement. So um, the main institutional expression of black power as an ideology was the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. This was formed in uh, Oakland, California in 1966 in response to issues of police brutality and police murdering uh, unarmed African Americans. And it began as an explicitly secular organization. Not that it um, promoted secularism, but that it was based um, off of secular humanism and a desire for human beings to do for themselves uh, without the assistance of a deity, right? Some of its main, um, some of its main goals were promoting, uh, were ending health disparities within African American communities. So they created uh, clinics and ran ambulance services, um, created schools for uh, African Americans, and probably the most famous um, of their endeavors was the free breakfast ch uh, program uh, for children that was run throughout the nation. And Huey Newton, um, the one of the founders of the party, is very explicit um, in his autobiography that this, these were sort of humanist uh, endeavors. Now, Newton, along with Stokely Carmichael, David Hilliard, and Eldridge Cleaver, uh, some of the key leaders of the Black Panther Party, were all very outspoken in their atheism. And the uh, newspaper of the party, the Black Panther, also contained poems uh, and other writers by black secular thinkers. Like earlier uh, free thinkers, they saw the church as conservative and they advanced a humanist politics that rejected the authority of what they termed Uncle Tom bootlicking preachers, 
So while we often see the civil rights movement as a religious movement dependent on ministers and churches, an examination of black power in the Black Panther Party, especially in urban regions such as Oakland or New York City, shows that secularism was often just as, if not more prominent than religion among these activists. And indeed, even if we look at the traditional civil rights movement in the South, it was actually the case that only a small minority of black churches engaged in open political activity. Um, in her uh, pioneering work, uh, Your Spirits Walk Beside Us, uh, historian Barbara Savage notes that the fact that we've come to see the civil rights movement as a religious one is a miracle in and of itself. So despite views of blacks as naturally religious, free thought has been a vital and significant component of black culture and politics since the 19th century. This history is not an obscure one as sources on black free thinkers are readily available in print and online. And it's a history that's not of obscure people as you know, some of the people I discuss in my book include Frederick Douglass, Hubert Harrison, Zora Neale Hurston, W.E.B. Du Bois, Nella Larson, Langston Hughes, Richard Wright, James Baldwin, Lorraine Hansberry, Huey Newton, and Alice Walker. Some of the leading intellectuals, some of the leading political figures in African American culture. It's vital to understand and teach this history to show black skeptics today that they are part of a long and prominent tradition of black free thinkers. Thank you. So we've got three minutes left, probably time for one or two questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's still the case today that African Americans at least identify as uh, overwhelmingly religious. Um, she, she asked about the participation of uh, ministers in um, today's civil rights movement and in cases like Ahmaud Arbery's. Um, you know, many African Americans, the uh, pretty overwhelming majority, are still religious, so I think it's pretty natural that uh, ministers are still going to be seen as important leaders uh, in black communities. At the same time, though, um, like Phil was talking about, uh, you know, Christianity is sort of on the decline in this country, and the same is true uh, within black communities. African Americans are increasingly uh, identifying as um, either secular or, um, you know, spiritual but not religious or whatnot. So part of that is, I think, an attempt to kind of regain something lost, right? To regain this sort of uh, power and, and prestige that they had uh, during the civil rights movement, right? So it's, um, it, it's trying to be uh, politically active and engaged, uh, but at the, at the same time trying to show the relevance of uh, a declining church, which is true across uh, the spectrum. Um, I'm from New York, politically left of uh, Schumer and Gillibrand, a few degrees to the right of AOC. I wonder if I have a reaction. I'm wondering if you think I'm on the money or totally off the wall. But when I, when I hear people of color referring to themselves with the N-word, my gut reaction is I could never, ever, ever imagine Jewish people calling each other the K-word. And I'm just curious, do you think I'm on the money or do you think I'm on the wall for feeling this way? Well, I, I'm not really sure uh, about Jewish people, but for, for African Americans, I think it's partially an attempt to reclaim uh, a word that was used as a slander, right? Um, and to show that it doesn't hold any power uh, over them. So, but I can't really speak to the other part of your question, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Cameron, for your excellent speech. I was uh, wondering about the true religious views of two people I have followed uh, throughout my life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Activist uh, comedian Dick Gregory and musician Gil Scott Heron, who have peppered their material with very, very much free thought material, but they seem to have the veneer of religious people. Do, do you have any insight as to their true religious views? I don't, I'm sorry. Um, I took this book pretty much right up to the 1960s. Um, and you know, I, I actually meant to, uh, to explore probably up to 2000 or so, 
But I found so much material, surprisingly, right, because nobody had written this sort of longer history. I found so much material that I decided to write a second volume uh, looking at this sort of after uh, the civil rights era. But yeah, I'm not too sure about those two. I didn't really encounter a lot of their beliefs. All right, thank you. Yep.